Well, good morning, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Um, uh, my name is Al. I'm the lead pastor at Compassion Christian. If you are new and I've not met you, I do hope I get a chance to say hello uh, before you leave today. And would you do us a special favor? As a first-time guest, we want to buy you a cup of coffee, and uh, we'd love for you to fill out the Connect card that's found on the inside of the worship folder that you received when you came in today. That is just our way of tracking uh, with you and just uh, just connecting. And so if you would take a few moments today and fill that out, and then when you're done, you can go to the, to the lobby and turn left, and there's a connecting point desk, and drop it off there, and one of our friendly volunteers will be glad to give you one of those. And we hope that's going to be just a memento of your time here with us today and that God speaks to you. Uh, so I want to also welcome this morning our members, our regular attenders as well. We're glad that you chose to be here today to start off your week, and I hope that today is going to be just part of that uh, being a special time for you to start it off the right way. Uh, I also want to look into the camera and say good morning to everyone watching on Facebook Live. Uh, we hope that you will make a comment and let us know that you're here, let us know that you're watching. Uh, share this as well so that people uh, around the, our city and even if within the sphere of your friends uh, in your circle of friends would know about this as well. And always we invite you to be a part of our live services on Sundays at 9 o'clock or at 1030. Uh, and I want to say to everybody here, uh, on, your, on your seats today, I have given you a couple of uh, invite cards for Christmas Eve. You know, Christmas Eve is that time when people are more open to invitations. Their minds are a little bit more uh, open to spiritual things. And so we're going to offer uh, a great opportunity for you to invite someone that you've been praying for, that you've been kind of uh, hoping would one day come to church with you. And Christmas Eve might be the, the opportune moment for that. Uh, so we have a very special service planned on that day. Uh, but use your cards as a way of inviting them and giving that to them as a, as a uh, reminder. And so please take these as many as you need and use these this week as we get ready. Uh, next weekend will be our last Sunday before Christmas Eve. So we hope that, that you'll take these and uh, take them with you so that people can come and hear the message of Jesus. Uh, today I want to uh, invite you to take your Bibles and open your Bibles up to Matthew chapter 1. If you don't have a Bible, I would encourage you, if you have one at home, uh, bring it with you every single week. If you don't have a, uh, maybe you, you don't have a Bible, let me know about that and we can work on that for you. Uh, you can also download a, a Bible app called Uversion. It's probably the most popular one uh, that it, it can help you track along. But as always, we'll put our scriptures on the screen. We'll get there in just a moment. Uh, but I also want to invite you to take your message notes. That's a way of uh, kind of tracking with what I am talking about today. It's a way of maybe categorizing the, the, the lessons and stuff that you hear. Maybe you want to go back to the later. Uh, so as you're turning over to Matthew chapter 1, it may not come as a surprise to you that studies are showing that Americans are lonelier than ever. Like even though we live in an unprecedented time of, of social connection opportunities, we're still very, very lonely. Even though we have free email services mainly and, and nationwide long distance phone calls available to us now, we are, take, we are talking less and less to each other. Uh, most everybody uh, in America owns a car, and the cost to fly commercially all across the country is within reach for most people if you save, and yet studies show that we're spending less and less time with our families. In fact, you go to the headlines, I, I, I looked this up in, in research for this, and I saw some headlines that are announcing the, the loneliness that we're feeling from MarketWatch. Uh, the headline was, once you hit this age, you're far more likely to feel lonely. I didn't really look and see what age that was because I was afraid it might be my age. Um, and then uh, from CNN.com, all the lonely people was the headline. Why more of us feel disconnected than ever before. Uh, ever before, excuse me. And then from the Medical Express, loneliness may be due to increasing age uh, the, the increasing aging population. And then one was scary uh, from Trib Live, the epidemic and consequences of male loneliness. Now, it's disturbing to, to think about it in those terms of being so lonely as a society because we are relational beings. Like we are designed and wired by our creator to be in relationship with each other. We are, we are called, uh, we are made for being with other people. Now, this is nothing new to you if you have been uh, around the church for a while, if you've heard me preach and teach. It's a value that, that we really stress because it's biblical and, and we re really want to build our ministry 
around this idea that you don't have to be lonely. You, you, will, you can be lonely, but you don't have to be if you choose not to be, and the need for relationships. And by now, uh, the theology of the church is actually being supported by the neurosciences. Like, you can actually go into psychology and neuroscience, and, you're fi- and we're finding out that it supports what the Bible really kind of teaches. I found a great article on this. Uh, from Pastor Jeremy Lineman on the Gospel Coalition's website, and he, he cited a 2018 Cigna Health study of 20,000 participants, and it was based on the UCLA Loneliness Scale, and it 22, they identified loneliness as a, as a significant struggle that they have. In fact, it's significantly higher than those who are 72 years Age, uh, age 72 and older. It confirmed what researchers had already discovered that we are a lonely nation. In fact, the, the former Surgeon General, Dr. Vivek Murthy, was the one who called loneliness an epidemic. He said it, it is an epidemic which leads to chronic inflammation and an increased, res, uh, increased risk of heart disease, arthritis, and diabetes. In fact, he said that loneliness has the same effect on mortality as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. That's pretty staggering, isn't it? To think about the fact that when we are isolated in our hearts, when we are lonely, it can have such a damaging effect. Loneliness is an undeniable problem in our Western culture, and it can actually be traced to the root of other problems. Like, you know, if, if you are isolated, if you don't have any friends and any, any, uh, any significant interactions, it actually can lead to a risk of heart disease. Uh, if you are lonely and isolated, there are chances that you are more at risk to view and utilize pornography. So how did we actually get here? Like, how did we get to be such a lonely culture? Well, Pastor Lineman in his article suggests two reasons I want to give to you uh, just at the outset. The first one he suggests is that loneliness is a symptom of an individualistic society. In other words, the, the Western mind, and when I talk about the West, I'm talking about uh, people in North America, basically, the United States specifically. But when the Western mind shifted from being primarily religious to primarily secular, that brought upon it the rise of individualism. Like, you just do your own thing. You don't need a group of people around you. You don't need to be involved in a, in a, in a smaller group of people or a larger group of people like the church. So loneliness is the, the symptom of an individualistic society where it's basically live and let live. You do your own thing. Don't worry about anybody else. But he said the second reason was that the frequency of local interactions is increasingly rare. What he means by that is that we can order groceries online from from any of the major grocers around here. We can pick those groceries up with very minimal interaction besides from the person who's telling us what they had for our list and what they did not and what they replaced and all of that. We can order that from from the, the comfort of our own home. We can go to the Starbucks app and we can order our coffee. We can walk right into the store and go to the front of the line and not really talk to anybody at all. We can do the same thing with, with fast food or we can get DoorDash or Grubhub or what, Uber Eats, whatever it is. We can do all of those things and we have very, uh, we have decreasing amounts of local interaction. We have less chance, uh, chance encounters with people and local conversations are being replaced by furious tapping on glowing screens. That's what we are discovering. And it's not just teenagers, okay? It's adults as well. Uh, Mark Dunkelman wrote in his book, The Vanishing Neighbor, I want you to listen to this, I put the the quote up on the screen, he said, adults today tend to prize different kinds of connections than their grandparents. Most, more of our time and attention today is spent on more intimate contacts and the most casual acquaintances. We've abandoned the relationships in between, the middle ring ties. So who is it that's in your circle? That seems to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And so I mentioned a moment ago that that neuroscience is actually backing up this idea that that we are lonely and that loneliness has some damaging effects. Uh, A researcher at UCLA used uh, MRIs, actually called functional MRIs, which uh, discovered that social isolation actually adversely affects your brain. 
They did MRIs to figure that out. That, that discovery and many more like it affirm that our brains are social. And I love this part. Uh, in, in fact, they say that the region of the brain that's activated when we experience rejection or loneliness is the very same region that registers the pain when we step on a Lego. The same area that's what registers when we feel lonely. It's that, that, that registration of pain. So both the hard sciences and the soft sciences agree that we are relational beings, that we are meant for community. We are designed to connect with one another and not just mere individuals, but interdependent people who are actually designed for community. Like we, we need each other. So loneliness hurts us and that pain can turn into physical sickness, which isn't cured by medication, but through friendship and connection. That's why I love the example of Jesus. You know, when Jesus was on earth, he was always in a relationship. Did you notice that? He came into this world, not isolated. He came into the world and he was born into a family. He spent his childhood and adulthood in obscurity, yes, but he was still in a family. And then he launched his ministry by inviting 12 other guys to follow him and, and minister with him and learn from him. And on the eve of his crucifixion, he had a meal with his disciples. Then he led them to pray with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so here's the question that I want you to ponder this morning. If Jesus found relationships essential, why don't we? Are, are we any different? Are we any better? Because like Jesus, we were meant for relationships. And when you feel alone especially when it's made worse by the holidays, I think God is trying to speak to you through the Christmas story. He's trying to speak to you and speak to all of us, not only during the Christmas story and in the time, but, but in all time. And so this passage, I think, that we're going to read today contains a great truth for you if you feel alone or when you feel alone. What we learn is that Emmanuel Jesus came to save us from sin and from isolation from him. And so this morning, I'm going to go deeper in our This is Christmas series, and, and we've been considering the question, what was God trying to communicate to us by sending Jesus? Now, last week, we discovered he was saying that you're not forgotten. I haven't forgotten about you. And today, we're going to look at how to fight off the feelings of isolation in a lonely world. We're going to discover how God actually comes to us in our loneliness. And so I've asked you to meet me over in Matthew chapter 1, and let's look at verses 18 through 23. It says, this is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David... <clears throat> Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. So the last part of that passage is an Old Testament prophecy that was, uh, that was given long, long, long ago, and Joseph is being told by the angel, which I believe is Gabriel, that this is, this is happening now as a fulfillment of that prophecy. So what we, don't, what we forget in the story is that seldom do we recognize that the Jewish people had been waiting for this Messiah to come, and they had been waiting for around 400 years. You see, we get Christmas every 12 months, and they had been waiting for 400 years. They had been waiting a while. And so here is Joseph being, he's betrothed to this young lady, and all of a sudden something happens that he knows is going to result in scandal. And in that moment, he's probably wondering, God, why have I been chosen to go through this? God, I feel not only forgotten by you, but I feel alone, like I can't tell anybody this. I can't share this with anybody. And, and God sends the angel to him to say, look, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife. And in the situation that seemed out of control, God was in control. He knew what he was doing. And Joseph was being told, you're not alone. I'm going to walk through this with you. In fact, one of the names of, of this son that's going to be born is Emmanuel. 
And so he's saying, there is going to, th- this is going to be my presence, the proof of my presence with you, that you are not alone. And so not only was, was Joseph feeling this way, but Mary was as well. And maybe you've been in a similar situation, or maybe you've been in a situation where you've gotten some news dropped on you like a bomb, and you're wondering, who else cares? Am I all alone? Am I the only one who's going through what I'm going through? Who's a safe person that I can, that I can commiserate with? Who's a safe person with whom I can share this? And then you're, you, know, you can begin to understand the weight of, uh, of loneliness that Joseph and Mary are going through. But what I've discovered about, about loneliness is that it's a result of the sin that happens in our world. Now, I don't mean that you're, you're lonely because you're a sinner. What I mean is we live in a world that is full of sin, and as a result, loneliness is one of those unfortunate realities. Sin separates us, and it isolates us, and it disintegrates our relationships, and it perpetuates this feeling of being alone. And the angel Gabriel said to Joseph, you're not alone. I know it feels that way, but you're not alone. And, but you're part of a greater narrative that God is trying to write, and he's using your life as a way of doing that. Now, the loneliness epidemic, I think, creates a great opportunity for the church to prioritize the right things, to prioritize community, to prioritize being with each other. So I want to give you some ways that you can push back against the epidemic of loneliness that, that maybe has, has affected you, and you're going to do it with the power of the Christmas message. So let's jump in. The first thing that I want you to understand is that you can believe and belong. Now, obviously, you know, we're trying to get you to believe in God. We're trying to get you to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But we also want you to belong to a place. We want you to belong somewhere with a group of believers. Research has showed that belonging is actually one of the most fundamental human needs beyond food and beyond shelter. And when you become part of a church family, you're not just committing, you're actually saying that you belong. Now, Rick Warren, in his Purpose Driven uh, books, uh, gave us this phrase, I think, believe and belong, many years ago. And one of the ways you fight back against loneliness is being part of what you're a part of right now. And that's being part of a church family, because when you do that, you know, when you actually become a member of a church, there are several things that happen. The first one is that it identifies you as a genuine believer. So you, you don't hear of a, a football player who doesn't have a team. Yes, they can, they can put on a helmet and put on the shoulder pads and they can put on the, the jersey, but if they don't have a team, they're not really part of the team. They're not really considered a football player. So if I am not committed to any specific group of Jesus followers, then how can I claim to be a follower of Jesus as well? And the church is made up of people from different backgrounds and different races and different social statuses. And that in and of itself is unique. Where else do you see that? It's a powerful witness to the world. So the second thing that being part of a church does, of believing and belonging, is that it moves you out of isolation, which can lead to self-centeredness. You know, the, the more I am not around other people, then I don't have to worry about their timetable. I don't have to worry about their preferences. I don't have to worry about uh, not agreeing with their decisions. I can basically make it all about me, and that's what isolation can do. It can lead to that, but the church is a place where we learn to get along with other people that we may not necessarily like or we may not necessarily agree with. It's a laboratory for learning how to be unselfish and sympathetic. It's a place to show agape love to other people. So as a member of the body who participates, then what happens is you learn what real fellowship is and you get connected to other people. A third way that you can believe and belong, a third benefit, is that it helps you when you face temptation. Now, it doesn't take temptation away, but it helps you when you face it. None of us are immune to temptation, not a single one. Given the right situation, we are all capable of falling into any type of sin pattern. Now, can you imagine, for example, think about one of the greatest moral failures in all of the Bible when David, King David, committed adultery with Bathsheba. Can you imagine if he had had uh, people around him that he was in community? Because the Bible says he stayed home when all the other when kings go to war. He stayed at home. He was isolated, which led to self-centeredness. And then all of a sudden, he had nobody around him to hold him accountable for him to you know for for him to to realize I don't need to be doing what I'm doing here. 
And so can you imagine if he would have had someone to, to pour that out to, to say, you know what, I'm tempted right now, and I need someone to, to just you know, hold me accountable. So you, you see, given the right situation, any of us could fall. And God has given us the responsibility of keeping up with each other and loving each other and keeping each other on track. And so we're called and commanded to be involved in each other's lives. So one of the ways you can do that is to actually become a member of a church. Now, if you're searching for a church home, I want to let you in on a little secret. You're not going to find a perfect church. You'll never find that, okay? But you can find a church, you should find a church that will encourage you, challenge you, and use you in the sense of, like, help you find your place of service. That is what you should do. And then the, th uh, the fourth one is that being part of a church and believing and belonging is it helps you grow spiritually, it helps you grow spiritually. You see, you'll never grow to full maturity by just attending worship services and being a passive spectator. It's just not going to happen. Only participation in the full life of a local church builds the spiritual muscle you need. That's, that's a fact, and it's proven from the Bible. Joseph Hellerman said this, and, and uh, he, he wrote a book called When the Church Was a Family. This is a, another long quote, but I want you to see it. I want to walk, uh, walk you through it. He says there, spiritual formation occurs primarily in the context of community. People who remain contented with their brothers and sisters in the local church almost invariably grow in self-understanding, and they mature in their ability to relate in healthy ways to God and to their fellow human beings. This is especially the case for those courageous Christians who stick it out through the often messy process of interpersonal discord and conflict resolution. Long-term interpersonal relationships are the crucible of genuine progress in the Christian life. People who stay grow. When we stay, we stay in the pocket, even though it's difficult at times, even though people aggravate us sometimes, we grow. You see, in our church, we want to make the pathway for membership as clear and as simple as possible. If you want to become a member of our church, we basically have one requirement— and if you ask, well, who can become a member of Compassion Christian Church? Well, the answer is that anyone who is a born-again, baptized believer, and by that, by baptism, we mean baptism by immersion. Now, in the New Testament, people were baptized as soon as they believed, and it was all by immersion. 3,000 people were baptized on the day of Pentecost, the same day they accepted where an Ethiopian high government official was baptized as soon as he was converted. Paul and Silas were baptized the very same, baptized the very same jailer who had imprisoned them along with his family at midnight in the hour that they believed. There were no delayed baptisms in the New Testament. So if you have not been baptized as a demonstration of your devotion to Jesus, you should do so as soon as possible as Jesus commanded. And if you've already been baptized, you should know that in 2020, we are going to be offering several membership seminars. In fact, we're going to offer members, our membership seminar three times in 2020, and it's going to be a, a two-hour to hour and a half, a two-hour or an hour and a half session, perhaps, in which you're going to learn about our beliefs, our vision, our mission, and how you can take your next step. But I want you to understand that, that one way to fight back against loneliness is to believe and to belong. And then the second thing is uh, that you can prioritize life-giving community. You need to prioritize it. God wants a family, and he created you to be part of his family, and his family is called the church. And because God is love, he absolutely prioritizes relationships. In fact, his identity is couched in terms of a family, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And when we become followers of Jesus, God becomes our Father, we become his children, our belie uh, other believers become our brothers and sisters, and the church becomes our spiritual family. In fact, in Psalm 68, look at how David describes God. He says, a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling, and God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing, but the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. You see, loneliness is not this new concept that we've come up with in modern pop psychology. God's redemption actually involves salvation from sin, but also sin essentially makes us isolated from God. 
And so in its simplest form, salvation is all about solving the problem of isolation from God and his people. Now, in the psalm, God is actually described as the one who frees us from the prison of loneliness into the freedom of family life. And so the family that he's talking about here is not a biological mommy and daddy family, but it's actually the family of God. So, so I'm hoping you're getting this theme that life is meant to be experienced and lived together. The Bible calls this fellowship or community. It includes unselfish loving, honest sharing, practical serving, sacrificial giving. Think about all of the one another commands in the Bible. And so when it comes to fellowship and community, the smaller, the better. You know, it's always been said that you can, you can worship with a crowd, but you can't fellowship with one. You need more than one. Jesus ministered in a group of 12 disciples. I think that was intentional. I think that was an example he's setting for us that every Christian should be involved in some type of life-giving group within their church, whether it's in a, a home fellowship or a Bible study or being on a serving team. That is where real community takes place, not in big gatherings. And I, I think that if you're kind of skittish about a smaller groups and what we call life groups around here. Just let me give you some, some characteristics of what makes a great life group and see if this is something that you might be attracted to. The first one is authenticity. This is when things are not superficial, surface-level chit-chat all the time. It's genuine, heart-to-heart, -heart, and sometimes gut-level sharing. It happens when people get real and honest about their struggles and what's really happening in their lives. They share their hurts and reveal their feelings and confess their failures and discuss their doubts, admit their fears and ask for help and prayer. That's what makes a great life group is authenticity. The second one is mercy. You see, fellowship should be a place of grace where when you make a mistake, it's not rubbed in your face. Because all of us need mercy when we stumble, when we fall, and, and you know, when we, uh, we need help getting back up and, and moving forward. We need to offer mercy to other people and be willing to receive it as well. So you won't have fellowship without forgiveness. You'll have to forgive somebody for speaking maybe uh, rudely to you or, or tell, you're telling something that wasn't true about you. You may experience those things in a group. No, no group is perfect. Because we are imperfect, we will inevitably hurt each other. Usually unintentionally, but sometimes it's intentionally. And so regardless of which, we need to extend mercy and grace to maintain fellowship. Another great, great example, a characteristic of a life group, is that it is giving and receiving. You see, all of us are more consistent in our faith when, when others walk with us and encourage us through mutual accountability. Like when we actually get to, to see that maybe others share different opinions about opinions about the Bible, or maybe they have different likes and dislikes, and we begin to understand that it's not just about me, it's not just about me receiving, it's about me giving as well. It's reciprocity, it's mutual accountability. Uh, another great characteristic of a life group is sympathy. Sympathy is not giving quick, flippant advice, but entering into the pain of other people to understand what people are going through. It means that we understand others and we have our feelings validated as well. The problem is that we are often in such a hurry to fix things that we don't actually just sit and take a moment to sympathize. Th there are so many benefits that you will experience in being part of a small group connected in real fellowship. You know, for over 2,000 years, Christians have met in small groups for fellowship, and that's often one of the greatest antidotes to loneliness. And if you've never been part of a group or a class like this, you really don't know what you're missing. But in just a month, in just one month, we're going to be trying to change that. After Christmas and uh, at the first of the year, we're going to be offering a new life group experience called Rooted. Now, Rooted is uh, something that, that, it, that we've just actually done with a pilot group in our church. We've done it for, uh, we did it back in the, in the, spring, uh, in the fall. And uh, Rooted is a catalytic and experiential group experience. It, it's 11 weeks long. Uh, it's made up of small groups of people between 10 and 15 people. Uh, and in this experience, you, you get to get into the rhythm and habits of daily devotions. You have weekly meetings with your group with, with outside experiences that happen, like serving together or having a prayer time together. You have a celebration time together as well. And so there are three questions that are going to get answered in our rooted experience. And these are questions that I think many of us probably want the answer to at one time or another. Who is God? What is the church? 
and what is my purpose? And we're going to, we're going to, to, to put our effort and resources and uh, all kinds of prayers into this, this initiative because we believe it's going to help you get connected to, to God and to other people. And so I'm excited to tell you about this now to give you just a foretaste of what's happening, and you're going to be hearing more about this in the coming weeks. But so I want to, to just get you to understand that when you prioritize life-giving community, that can help you. Now, some of you may uh, have, have some doubts and some concerns about it, and that's okay. That's okay. You can still come to church here. In fact, I want you to come to church here. I want you to come on Sunday morning. And if that's all you can do is just come on Sunday morning and you can't get involved in a group, okay, that's fine. But I'm going to keep praying that you will join a group. And I'm going to keep, you know, we're, we're going to keep talking about it. And so it's going to be like positive peer pressure up here, right? All the cool kids are doing it. So that's what we're going to do. But I want you to understand that, that God sees you in your loneliness. And I believe that part of the story of Christmas, of God sending Emmanuel, God with us, is to say that you're not alone, that someone's with you and he's here, and that someone wants to save you, that someone wants to redeem you, that someone wants to walk with you, and his name is Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, today, I ask that uh, we would humbly consider what your word says, current reaction, and what our practice is, and to realize it's not that we want to change the word of God to suit what we want, but we need to change and modify our lives to what the word of God says. So God, I pray that today uh, you would break down the walls of uh, defenses, that you would help us to to get past any reasons or excuses for not being able to get involved in a group, and that we would just find a way, Lord, to, to connect in that way. Father, I also pray for those who are wandering alone, and they're trying to, to live a life of self-righteousness. They're trying to self-justify. They're trying to, to get to heaven on their own efforts. God, I pray that you will help them to see that there's only one way to, to, to get to heaven, and that is through your son, Jesus by throwing ourselves on uh, your mercy and receiving him as Lord and Savior. So, Lord, right now, during this time of commitment, we want to be willing and, and ready to come forward and make public decisions, and others, Lord, are going to be making decisions right uh, where they're standing, to, and they're going to resolve to do differently. So, Lord, whatever our decision is today, we, we offer it to you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to stand together and sing. Um, we're going to sing about the mighty power of the risen Jesus. And if this is something that you want to 